the concept of God in Islam and Damp, who is Allah. It is a known fact that every language has one or more terms that are used to refer to God and sometimes to lesser deities at the same time. This is not the case with Allah. Allah is the personal name of the one true God. Nothing else can be called Allah. The term has no plural or gender. This shows its uniqueness when compared with the word God, which can be made plural, as in gods, or made feminine. As in goddess. It is interesting to note that Allah is the personal name of God in Aramaic, the language of Jesus and a sister language of Arabic. The one true God is a reflection of the unique concept that Islam associates with Allah. To a Muslim, Allah is the almighty creator and sustainer of the universe, who is similar to nothing, and nothing is comparable to him. The Prophet Muhammad was asked by his contemporaries about Allah. The answer came directly from Allah himself in the form of a short chapter of the Quran, which is considered to be the essence of the unity or the motto of monotheism. This is chapter 112, which reads, In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Say, O Messenger, he is Allah who is alone in being a deity. There is no deity except him. He is the master to whom belongs all sovereignty and perfect, beautiful qualities. The one to whom all creation turned to. The one who did not give birth to anyone, nor did anyone give birth to him. So he has no offspring, may he be glorified, nor any parent. Nor does he have any equal from his creation. Some non-Muslims allege that God in Islam is a stern and cruel God who demands to be obeyed fully and is, consequently, not loving and kind. Nothing could be farther from the truth than this allegation. It is enough to know that, with the exception of one, each of the 114 chapters of the Quran begins with the verse, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. In one of the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, may the mercy and blessings of God be upon him, we are told that God is more loving and kind than a mother to her dear child. On the other hand, God is also just. Hence, evildoers and sinners must have their share of punishment, and the virtuous must have God's bounties and favors. Actually, God's attribute of mercy has full manifestation in his attribute of justice. People suffering throughout their lives for his sake should not receive similar treatment from their Lord as people who oppress and exploit others their whole lives. Expecting similar treatment for them would amount to negating the very belief in the accountability of man in the hereafter and thereby negate all the incentives for a moral and virtuous life in this world. The following Quranic verses are very clear and straightforward in this respect. Indeed, those who are mindful of Allah by fulfilling his commands and refraining from the things he has not allowed, will have gardens of pleasure by their Lord. Wherein they will live in permanent luxury. Should I make the Muslims the same as the disbelievers in terms of requital, as the idolaters of Mecca claim? O oh, idolaters! What is wrong with you, how can you come to this oppressive, warped conclusion? Quran 68, 34, 36 Islam rejects characterizing God in any human form or depicting him as favoring certain individuals or nations on the basis of wealth, power, or race. He created human beings as equals. They may distinguish themselves and get his favor through virtue and piety only. The concepts, such as God resting on the seventh day of creation, God wrestling with one of his soldiers, God being an envious plotter against mankind, or God being incarnate in any human being, are considered blasphemy from the Islamic point of view. The unique usage of Allah as a personal name of God is a reflection of Islam's emphasis on the purity of the belief in God that is the essence of the message of all God's messengers. Because of this, Islam considers associating any deity or personality with God as a deadly sin that God will never forgive, despite the fact that he may forgive all other sins. The Creator must be of a different nature from the things created because, if he is of the same nature as they are, he will be temporal and will therefore need a maker. It follows, therefore, that nothing is like him. Furthermore, if the maker is not temporal, then he must be eternal. If he is eternal, however, he cannot be caused, and if nothing caused him to come into existence, nothing outside him causes him to continue to exist, which means that he must be self-sufficient. And if he does not depend on anything for the continuance of his own existence, then this existence can have no end, so the Creator is, therefore, eternal and everlasting. Hence we know that he is self-sufficient or self-subsistent, and everlasting or, to use a Quranic term, al qayyim he is the first and the last. The Creator does not create only in the sense of bringing things into being, he also preserves them and takes them out of existence and is the ultimate cause of whatever happens to them. Allah is the Creator of everything. There is no Creator besides him. He has charge over everything, he plans its affair and disposes of it as he wills. To him alone belong the keys of the treasures of goodness in the heavens and the earth. 
he grants it to whoever he wills and withholds it from whoever he wills. Those who reject Allah's signs they are the losers, as they are deprived of faith in the worldly life and they will enter the fire to live there forever in the hereafter. Quran 39,62-63 And God says, There is no creature that walks on the surface of the earth, whatever it may be, except that Allah has undertaken, through His grace, to provide for it. He, may He be glorified, knows where it lives on earth and He knows where it will die. The provision, place of living and place of death for everything, including creatures are in a clear book, which is the preserved tablet. Quran 11 6. God's Attributes If the Creator is eternal and everlasting, then His attributes must also be eternal and everlasting. If this is so, then His attributes are absolute. Can there be more than one Creator with such absolute attributes? Can there be, for example, two absolutely powerful Creators? A moment's thought shows that this is not feasible. The Quran summarizes this argument in the following verses. Allah has not taken a child as the disbelievers claim, nor is there any true deity alongside him. If there were to be any true deity alongside him, every deity would take his share of the creation he made and they would dominate one another, causing the order of the universe to become corrupt. The reality is that none of this has occurred, proving that the true deity is Allah alone. He is pure and holy of what the idolaters describe him with, namely partners and children which are unbefitting for him. Quran 23 91. Also. If there were numerous gods in the heavens and the earth, they would have been ruined, due to the gods disputing in the kingdom. But the reality is not like this. So Allah, Lord of the throne, is pure of the lie the idolaters describe him with, namely that he has partners. Quran 21 22. The Oneness of God. The Quran reminds us of the falsity of all alleged gods. To the worshippers of man made objects it asks, but Abraham countered them with steadfastness, and said to them rebuking them, Do you worship idols instead of Allah, which you carve with your own hands? Quran 37 95 Also. Say, O Messenger, to the disbelievers who worship others together with Allah, who is the Creator and the Controller of the heavens and the earth. Say, O Messenger, it is Allah who is their Creator and Controller and you acknowledge this. Say, O Messenger, to them, have you taken for yourselves protectors other than Allah who are themselves helpless? They cannot draw any benefit for themselves nor remove any harm. How then will they be able to do so for others? Say to them, O Messenger, is the disbeliever, who has no insight, equal to the believer who can see and who is guided? And is disbelief, which is layers of darkness, equal to faith, which is light? Have they assigned in the creation partners to Allah, may he be glorified, who have created anything like Allah's creation so that their creation is indistinguishable from his? Say to them, O Messenger, Allah alone is the creator of all things. He has no partner in creation. He is the one and only deity, who solely deserves to be worshipped, and he is the all-compelling. Quran 13:16. To the worshippers of heavenly bodies it cites the story of Abraham. When the darkness of the night came over Abraham, he began to debate with his people in order to bring them from idolatry to monotheism. His people used to worship the stars, so when he saw a star he said, This is my Lord, with the aim of convincing his people. When the star disappeared, he said, I do not like that which disappears, because the true God is always present and never disappears. The belief of his people was that gods do not go away and disappear, so he used this same belief of theirs as an argument against them. When Abraham saw the moon rising, he said to his people, This is my Lord, continuing his argument against them. When it disappeared, he said, If Allah does not guide me to his oneness and worship I will certainly become one of the people who are astray from his religion and who worship others besides him. When he saw the sun rising, he said to his people, This thing that is rising is my Lord. It is bigger than the star and the moon, further continuing his plan of argument and proof against them. When it disappeared, he said, O oh my people, I am free of what you associate as partners with Allah. I have devoted my religion to Allah who created the heavens and the earth without any precedent, throwing off idolatry and embracing pure monotheism. I am not one of the idolaters who worship others besides Allah. Quran 6 76-79 The Believer's Attitude In order to be a Muslim, that is, to surrender oneself to God, it is necessary to believe in the oneness of God, in the sense of His being the only creator, preserver, nourisher, etc. But this belief is not enough. Many of the idolaters knew and believed that only the Supreme God could do all this. But this was not enough to make them Muslims.
In addition to this belief, one must acknowledge the fact that it is God alone who deserves to be worshipped, and thus abstains from worshipping any other thing or being. Having achieved this knowledge of the one true God, man should constantly have faith in him, and should allow nothing to induce him to deny truth. What this means is that, if one submits knowingly to God without reservations, and admits he is the only one worthy of your worship, one must consequently worship him. That is, knowing we owe him obedience means putting into practice what we acknowledge in our hearts. God asks, rhetorically. So do you think, O oh people, that I created you as a plaything without any wisdom, so that there will be no reward or punishment as with animals? And that you will not return to me on the day of judgment for the reckoning and recompense? Quran 23,115. He also states categorically. And I did not create jinns and men except for my worship alone. I did not create them to make a partner for me. Quran 51,56. Hence, when faith enters a person's heart, it causes certain mental states that result in certain actions. Taken together, these mental states and actions are the proof for the true faith. The Prophet, may the mercy and blessings of God be upon him, said. Faith is that which resides firmly in the heart and which is proved by deeds. Foremost among these mental states is the feeling of gratitude towards God, which could be said to be the essence of worship. The feeling of gratitude is so important that a non-believer is called kafir, which means, one who denies a truth, and also, one who is ungrateful. A believer loves, and is grateful to God for the bounties he has bestowed upon him, but being aware of the fact that his good deeds, whether mental or physical, are far from being commensurate with divine favors, he is always anxious lest God should punish him, here or in the hereafter. He therefore fears him, surrenders himself to him and serves him with great humility. One cannot be in such a mental state without being almost all the time mindful of God. Remembering God is thus the life force of faith, without which it fades and withers away. The Quran tries to promote this feeling of gratitude by repeating the attributes of God very frequently. We find most of these attributes mentioned together in the following verses of the Quran. He is Allah, the one whom there is no true deity except him, he is the knower of the absent and the present, nothing is hidden from him. The benevolent of the world and the afterlife and their merciful, his mercy encompasses the worlds, the master, the pure and sacred from every deficiency, the faultless from every defect. The corroborator of his messengers with manifest signs, the observer of the actions of his servants, the Almighty whom no one can overpower. The omnipotent who controls everything through his power, the imperious. Pure and glorified is he from the idols and other things the idolaters ascribe to him. He is Allah, the one whom there is no true deity except him, he is the knower of the absent and the present, nothing is hidden from him. The benevolent of the world and the afterlife and their merciful, his mercy encompasses the worlds, the master, the pure and sacred from every deficiency, the faultless from every defect. The corroborator of his messengers with manifest signs, the observer of the actions of his servants, the Almighty whom no one can overpower. The omnipotent who controls everything through his power, the imperious. Pure and glorified is he from the idols and other things the idolaters ascribe to him. He is the creator who created everything, the originator of things, the fashioner of his creations according to his wishes. For him may he be glorified are the most beautiful names which contain his lofty attributes. Everything in the heavens and on earth glorifies him from every deficiency. He is the Almighty whom no one can overpower, the wise in his creation, legislation, and decree. Quran 59,22-24 Also, Allah is the one who alone deserves to be worshipped. He is the one who lives perfectly without any death or deficiency. He exists by himself and is not in need of any of his creation. The creation only exists through him and is always in need of him. Drowsiness or sleep does not come upon him due to the perfection of his life and existence. He alone controls the heavens and the earth. No one can intercede before him without his acceptance and permission. He knows what has happened in the past and what will happen in the future. The creation has no share in his knowledge unless he wills to grant them some of it. His throne covers the vastness of the heavens and the earth. It is not difficult for him to preserve the heaven and the earth. He is high in his essence and attributes and great in his dominion and authority. Quran 2 255. Also, Jesus, son of Mary, will never be proud and reject being a servant of Allah. The close angels who do not go against Allah's instruction and who do as they are instructed will also never disregard being Allah's servants. How, then, do you take Jesus as a god? How do the idolaters take angels as gods? If anyone rejects worshipping Allah and turns away from it, that he will gather all of them before him on the day of rising and will recompense each one with what they deserve. Quran 4 171 Thus we have three parts to our acknowledgement of God as the only true God. 
We must believe he is the ultimate creator, controller, and judge of the universe and everything in it. We must refrain from the worship of anything except him, and then actually direct our worship to him. And we must know that he alone has all the divine attributes and names, and we cannot apply them to any other being, no matter who they are. If one merely acknowledges with one's lips these necessities, even should we refrain from applying them to other gods, it is not enough. They must be sincerely directed to the one you acknowledge as well. Who is Allah? Some of the biggest misconceptions that many non-Muslims have about Islam have to do with the word Allah. For various reasons. Many people have come to believe that Muslims worship a different God than Christians and Jews. This is totally false, since Allah is simply the Arabic word for God, and there is only one God. Let there be no doubt, Muslims worship the God of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David and Jesus, peace be upon them all. However, it is certainly true that Jews, Christians and Muslims all have different concepts of Almighty God. For example, Muslims, like Jews, reject the Christian beliefs of the Trinity and the Divine Incarnation. This, however, does not mean that each of these three religions worships a different God, because, as we have already said, there is only one true God. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all claim to be Abrahamic faiths, and all of them are also classified as monotheistic. However, Islam teaches that other religions have, in one way or another, distorted and nullified a pure and proper belief in Almighty God by neglecting His true teachings and mixing them with man-made ideas. First of all, it is important to note that Allah is the same word that Arabic-speaking Christians and Jews use for God. If you pick up an Arabic Bible, you will see the word Allah being used where God is used in English. This is because Allah is a word in the Arabic language equivalent to the English word God with a capital G. Additionally, the word Allah cannot be made plural, a fact which goes hand in hand with the Islamic concept of God. It is interesting to note that the Aramaic word El, which is the word for God in the language that Jesus spoke, is certainly more similar in sound to the word Allah than the English word God. This also holds true for the various Hebrew words for God, which are El and Ila. And the plural or glorified form, Elohim. The reason for these similarities is that Aramaic, Hebrew, and Arabic are all Semitic languages with common origins. It should also be noted that in translating the Bible into English, the Hebrew word El is translated variously as God, God, and Angel. This imprecise language allows different translators, based on their preconceived notions, to translate the word to fit their own views. The Arabic word Allah presents no such difficulty or ambiguity, since it is only used for Almighty God alone. Additionally, in English, the only difference between God, meaning a false God, and God, meaning the one true God, is the capital G. Due to the above-mentioned facts, a more accurate translation of the word Allah into English might be the one and only God or the one true God. More importantly, it should also be noted that the Arabic word Allah contains a deep religious message due to its root meaning and origin. This is because it stems from the Arabic verb ta'alaha, or alaha, which means, to be worshipped. Thus in Arabic, the word Allah means, the one who deserves all worship. This, in a nutshell, is the pure monotheistic message of Islam. Suffice it to say that just because someone claims to be a monotheistic Jew, Christian, or Muslim, that does not keep them from falling into corrupt beliefs and idolatrous practices. Many people, including some Muslims, claim belief in one God even though they've fallen into acts of idolatry. Certainly, many Protestants accuse Roman Catholics of idolatrous practices in regards to the saints and the Virgin Mary. Likewise, the Greek Orthodox Church is considered idolatrous by many other Christians because in much of their worship they use icons. However, if you ask a Roman Catholic or a Greek Orthodox person if God is one, they will invariably answer. Yes, dot. This claim, however, does not stop them from being creature-worshipping idolaters. The same goes for Hindus, who just consider their gods to be manifestations or incarnations of the one supreme God. Before concluding, there are some people out there who are obviously not on the side of truth. That want to get people to believe that Allah is just some Arabian god, such as the claim propagated by Robert Mori in his work, The Moon God Allah in the Archaeology of the Middle East. For a discussion of this work, please see the following. And that Islam is completely other, meaning that it has no common roots with the other Abrahamic religions, i.e. Christianity and Judaism. To say that Muslims worship a different god because they say Allah is just as illogical as saying that French people worship another god because they use the word Dio. That Spanish-speaking people worship a different god because they say Dios or that the Hebrews worshipped a different god because they sometimes call him Yahweh. Certainly. Reasoning like this is quite ridiculous. It should also be mentioned that claiming that any one language uses the only the correct word for God is tantamount to denying the universality of God's message to mankind, which was to all nations. 
tribes and people through various prophets who spoke different languages. We would like to ask our readers about the motives of these people. The reason is that the ultimate truth of Islam stands on solid ground and its unshakable belief in the unity of God is above reproach. Due to this, Christians can't criticize its doctrines directly, but instead fabricate things about Islam that aren't true so that people lose the desire to learn more. If Islam were presented in the proper way to the world, it surely might make many people reconsider and reevaluate their own beliefs. It is quite likely that when they find out that there is a universal religion in the world that teaches people to worship and love God, while also practicing pure monotheism, would at least feel that they should re-examine the basis for their own beliefs and doctrines.